Merci d'être venu et je voudrais remercier le professeur Leclerc pour cette invitation et le euh, professeur Tremblay pour ses commentaires. Je vais parler en anglais, si vous me permettez, mais je serai très, très content de prendre des questions euh, ou, ou des commentaires en français après. Si seulement vous me permettez de répondre en anglais, euh, tout, tout devrait se passer bien. So, um, thanks for having me. I'll, my paper is on proportionality, which I gather is a, a popular subject here as well. I just in the elevator, I saw that there's a talk on proportionality tomorrow in civil procedure. I might try to come to that. I could learn something about that. It would fit, actually, my, my interests uh, very much. This is about proportionality in comparative constitutional law. Um, and in particular, I try to engage with work in comparative constitutional law that tries to understand both how and why proportionality reasoning has become so popular in so many systems, but also how and why there might be differences between those systems. Um, and so it's a literature that engages with both similarity and difference, and that's usually where the most interesting questions lie. So at the moment, there is a paper, um, uh, but at the moment I try to do a lot of things in the paper, possibly too many things, and so I'd be very happy for your suggestions to try to uh, tidy it up a little bit. So if we start with the comparative constitutional law literature on proportionality, it's a very rich literature and it's a growing literature, but I think it's limited in two interesting ways. First, um, this literature does very little to test what we know about proportionality in constitutional law and comparative constitutional law against what we know about similarities and differences between legal systems in other areas of law. So it's, in that sense, it's disciplinary specific. It's comparative constitutional law, and it stays comparative constitutional law. And so there's not much that we know about links to other fields of law in this body. Um, so that's one limitation. A second limitation is that this literature on proportionality in comparative constitutional law normally remains highly formal in that it's interested mostly in issues of doctrinal similarities and differences. Right? So a typical article or a paper in this field would try to look at how many steps proportionality reasoning might have in one jurisdiction, and then it might ask whether in another jurisdiction proportionality reasoning has the same number of steps or more or fewer, and it might look at whether one of these steps is more important than another. It might look at whether the courts are consistent in applying this reasoning. Right? So it's mostly focused on issues of doctrine and of, of form the coherence of the case law, this sort of thing. These are, of course, important questions, but what they don't really engage with is a more substantive understanding of proportionality. They don't talk much about substantive outcomes. And it's easy to see why, because that would actually be very difficult. Um, in fact, I don't think we even have the vocabulary to talk about this. If I wanted to say, for example, American constitutional review is less proportionate than constitutional review in Germany, for example. If you make that statement, it sounds odd. It's difficult to make sense of that. Or even within one system, if you say the court in this case gave an outcome that was more proportionate than in this other case, I think we would also find it difficult to make sense of those statements. Uh, I wouldn't even know how to say this in French, more or less proportionate. It's, it's difficult. Um, and so, that means that we have very little sense about whether among all these systems that use proportionality reasoning in, compare, in constitutional law, which ones of them are better or worse than others at guaranteeing the ideals that proportionality reasoning embodies. We have very little sense, in other words, about the idea of proportionateness. I'll come back to this a little bit later. So those are the two limitations that I start from formal focus and, and, and little knowledge about links between constitutional issues and other fields of law. So the paper tries to make contributions on both those points, and it does so through something that I've called, um, slightly jokingly, comparative comparative law, which is that you compare with other areas of comparative law, uh, and in particular I've chosen the field of comparative criminal law or comparative criminal justice, which also is known sometimes as comparative punitiveness or comparative criminalization. This is, in short, the literature 
that tries to understand the variations in patterns of criminalization and imprisonment among different legal systems, right? The way legal systems treat offenders, uh, that sort of question. Now, that literature, it's a vast literature, it has a million dollar question. And the million dollar question, again, I don't know what the French equivalent is of the million dollar question, but there you go. And the million dollar question is, um, and I think you'll be familiar with this, is why is it that the United States incarcerates so many more people per capita than almost any other country in the world, right? And not only do they incarcerate more people than any other country, they also do so generally under harsher conditions. Right? So for example, you've read about this in the newspapers, prisons in Texas that have no air conditioning, that sort of thing. Um, and so this is a question, if you will, of US exceptionalism. It's interesting to note, just as an aside, and this is not in the paper, that it may be that very recently this phenomenon has peaked, that we have witnessed a peak in the harsh treatment of offenders, somewhere in the late 2000s. Uh, and, and so people are beginning to study that phenomenon. At the moment, I'm looking at the trend towards ever increased levels of incarceration, harshness, and punishment. So, so there is an uncontested, I think almost uncontested fact of US exceptionalism when it comes to punitiveness. Now what is interesting is that when we go back to comparative constitutional law, there is also a discussion about US exceptionalism, but it's much more fluid and, and less clear. US exceptionalism is a live issue in relation to proportionality reasoning because people have observed that US law on constitutional review doesn't look quite the same as it does elsewhere. There doesn't seem to be a commitment to a general principle of law of proportionality. The US Supreme Court doesn't really use the term proportionality explicitly. It doesn't use the same three or four or five or six part test that many other countries use. So there seems to be some difference, but we don't really quite know how significant this difference is. And we don't also quite know what its implications are. And so the idea for the paper is simply to compare, to look comparatively at the, these two exceptionalisms and try to see whether we can learn something from that. So the most ambitious question would then be, is there any link between the fact that the US sends so many people to prison and treats them so badly, and the fact that they don't use proportionality reasoning in constitutional review in precisely the same way as other countries do? That's a hugely ambitious question, and I don't have a direct answer to that, right? But it's interesting to think about. Um, and even if you don't buy that connection, I think there is still something we can learn about the comparison on the two points that I suggested earlier, both on trying to learn something about the way practices and ideas in constitutional fields relate to practice and ideas in other fields, and also to try to get a, see if it's possible to develop a more substantive, a thicker substantive understanding of La proportionalité. Yeah. So uh, to do that, uh, I do a number of things in the, the paper. The, in one section, I introduce simply the fields of comparative constitutional law and the literature on proportionality there. I introduce the literature on comparative punitiveness and criminalization. And I talk a little bit about the ideas of US exceptionalism in both those fields. Um, for the discussion here, I'll just make uh, one or two points that I think are relevant. The first point I make is that I, I do make the case that U.S. law on constitutional review is special in, an import, in some important sense when it comes to the role and the meaning of the principle of proportionality. Um, not everybody agrees with that. Well, let me point that out. But I, I, make, I try to make the case that it is distinctive. And the distinctiveness, I think, is this. If you look at US law, US constitutional law, of course you find references to ideas on proportionality. And of course you find these references and they go back a long time to the founding period even. So the principle is there. And you might say, well, of course it is there. If you look at the detailed doctrines of US constitutional law in the area of constitutional review, and rights review, you also see a lot of doctrines that look a lot like proportionality reasoning or at least parts of the test of proportionality reasoning that you are familiar with. So the principle is there uh, to some extent, and the doctrines are also there to some extent. What is different, I think, than elsewhere, and I'm taking Germany as my prime example, 
And it'd be interesting to think about how this relates to Canada, of course, about which I know virtually nothing. Uh, but the way it relate is this is different from Germany is in the link, the connections between the principle and the doctrine. Right? So if you take an ideal, typical view of how a German lawyer might talk about this, the way I understand it, is they would say, well, you have a general principle of proportionality. It covers everything. All domains of law are subject to this, to this principle. And whenever that principle appears, it is in the form of the three or four or five or six part proportionality test. Right? So there's a perfect match between proportionality as a principle and proportionality as an institution, as a doctrine. Right? And whenever that doctrine appears, it is because the principle of proportionality is active. So they fit precisely. And there's not really anything, there's not really any area of law that is not covered by the principle and therefore also by the doctrine. And there's also not really any other manifestation of the ideals of proportionality that are not covered by this doctrine. Right? So there's a perfect match between the principle and the doctrine. That is not the case, I think, quite clearly in the United States. And there's a, a recent overview article by Vicki Jackson, it's a professor you may have heard of. She has a, an article which is called Constitutional Law in an Age of Proportionality. And she makes this, I think, she confirms this position. So, that's the first claim here, that I do think there is a difference. But it's, it's not a simple, the US doesn't have proportionality and the rest of the world has proportionality. It's a little bit more complicated than that, and I've tried to make that clear. Um, OK, so that's the first point here. The second point in this section of the paper is to try to present what punitiveness means. And here I just go through the literature in comparative criminal justice that discusses punitiveness. And, um, and I try to show how they would measure this. So one way you might measure punitiveness is just to compare imprisonment rates. And you just look at how many people are sent to prison. You might also discuss sentence length, so for how long, what are the average or median sentence lengths, that sort of thing. So there's statistical ways of doing this, and people have done that. And so criminal justice lawyers are fairly confident in saying this system is more punitive than that system. And they do so in terms of prison length, but also in lots of other ways. So they look at the harshness of conditions inside prisons, and they look more generally at the landscape of, 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 uh, of, of penal um, measures. Right? So for example, for the US, they might point to laws that I'm sure you've heard about, like three strikes, you're out laws, or the treatment of juvenile offenders under adult rules, or life without parole, or minimum sentences, right? There's lots of these measures. And when you, when you aggregate that, these scholars in that field are fairly confident in saying this system is more punitive than that system, or this system is more punitive now than it was a few years ago, right? And that's, I think that's important, that we keep in mind that, that you can compare systems in terms of their punitiveness. So we'll come back to that in a little while. Okay, so then the the... Next section of the uh, paper looks at this punitiveness literature, the comparative criminal justice literature, and sees what we can learn about from that literature about the following question, and that's the question that I started off with, which is why is it that so many legal systems have turned to proportionality, but also that we see differences in the way they do that? Right? And let's take the US as, a, as an outlier here. Uh, and I'm particular inter particularly interested from among the criminal justice literature in the studies that turn to factors that you might call cultural factors. So people have tried to explain these patterns of imprisonment and harshness in different ways. You might look at factors that are not really cultural factors, for example, factors of political economy. And so that's been done. But there are studies, studies that look at cultural factors. And I find those particularly interesting because recent work on proportionality in constitutional law, comparative constitutional law, has also tried to look at cultural factors to explain similarities and divergence. And so I want to see whether there's something we can uh, uh, learn here. So I try to draw a number of different lessons from the comparative criminal justice literature. Um, now, when scholars working on rates of imprisonment and why is the US so much harsher than elsewhere, why is the US harsher now than it was in the 1950s, right? that literature, when they use cultural factors, they tend to do so in one of three ways, I think. The first is this, that you go back a long time in history, 
let's say, to the foundation of the American Republic or to the French Revolution, and you try to identify values that are different and practices that are different at that time, and you say, that's what explains differences in imprisonment rates now. So this has been done notably by a professor at Yale Law School whose name is Jim Whitman, who's written a book which is called Harsh Justice, and it does precisely this. So he, just to give an example, maybe you're familiar with the book, uh, it compares Im imprisonment and harsh treatment of offenders in the US on the one hand and France and Germany on the other hand. And Whitman says to understand this, you have to go back to the French and the American Revolution. And the idea, one, here's a number of ideas, but one of the ideas is that in Europe, these revolutions were about abolishing nobility. And what happened was that before that time, nobles would get, noblemen, the, the nobility, would get more favorable treatment in terms of sentencing. They would have nicer cells in, I suppose, in the Bastille or wherever they were. Right? And, and, um, and at the time of the French Revolution, when the no nobility was ab uh, abolished, the idea was that everybody should now get this better treatment. Right? And he calls this a process of leveling up. And the argument is that on the US side, there was no nobility to be abolished. And so what we have seen there, this is his argument, is a process of leveling down. And so everybody now has the same horrible treatment. Right? That's part of his story. There's, of course, more, more to it. But the point for me is that you have to go back all the way you know, to the 18th century to, to make the claim. He has one other aspect of the claim that I'll come back to, is he tries to explain differences in imprisonment rates and harsh treatment of offenders between these countries in terms of whether the state is strong or weak. Now, you might intuitively think of the US, for example, as a strong state, but in these kind of definitions, the US would be a weak state, and it's weak in the sense that it has very little institutional autonomy. Right? So, so there's, you could also call this a hyper-democracy or a deeply decentralized state. So the regional units have much more power than the center. The center can almost has very little power. There is a lot of direct democratic pressure, populist pressure. Right? And, and there is, for example, no elite civil service that, that is able to filter these pressures. So the US would be a weak state, and France and Germany would rather be strong states. And so Whitman comes to a paradox that we'll also return to later, is that he says, it seems that strong states are correlated with more lenient punishment, and weak states correlate with harsher punishment. So something that for us to think about. So that's, I mean, in a nutshell, a, a, a rich argument. The point to remember is, I think, the first way of using cultural factors is you say you have to go to deep foundations, and that's what explains differences now. The problem with that approach is, I think, obvious. And it's that if you try to compare imprisonment rates in the US and, let's say, Germany, they only really begin to diverge in the middle of the 1960s. Uh, and it really takes off in the 70s, and then the difference really explodes in the late 80s and the early 90s. And so, of course, if the French Revolution and the American Revolution are to explain everything, that's a problem. We can't make sense of that. So, so, so there's a limitation to this literature. The opposite approach, the second approach of using cultural factors is to look at pressures that are contemporary, that affect us now, on kind of a global scale. And so you say countries have undergone lots of transformations and changes, mostly in the maybe the past three or four decades, and, um, and, and individuals have become exposed to many different kinds of risk, and people have become more uncertain, and this results in different things, in the rise of populist policies, perhaps, but it also results in a more repressive state apparatus. Perhaps the logic is something like, well, the state authorities want to show that they can manage certain things. Populist politicians are elected who want to push for harsher punishment. Right? And so one uh, influential study that makes this argument is the work by David Garland, a sociologist, and he calls this the culture of control. So you look at contemporary anxieties associated with different forms of globalization. You say people are exposed to lots of different kinds of risks. They might lose their job. Um, uh, and, and so they look to the state to regulate this. The state, it turns out, and the elites are, are not very good at regulating this and protecting their jobs. But what they can do is send lots of people to prison. And so that's what they do. Now, again, I'm simplifying, but that's the, that's the basic argument. Again, a very influential argument. Of course, this approach also has a problem that many people have pointed out, which is that if we are all subject to these same pressures, why is it that the response 
in criminalization has been so different as between different countries. Right? How do we explain the divergence? And so a third approach, I think, tries to combine these two, which is you might call a filtering approach. And here you say there are both contemporary pressures that most Western countries at least are subject to, be it Germany or Canada or the US, um, but these pressures do not always have the same impact. And that is because they are filtered through local institutional and other forms of cultural traditions that may have very deep roots. Maybe this is where we go back to the French Revolution. And so the impact is a filtering mechanism. Yeah. Um, and so uh, what, I, what I try to do in the paper is to suggest that I think that approach probably fits best the narrative of um, the spread of proportionality. This means that I'm skeptical. You always respond to something, of course. What I'm responding to here is, I think, increasingly popular accounts of a kind of a long durée history of proportionality, where people say you need to go back to Prussian administrative law of the middle and late 19th century, and that's where the origins of proportionality lie. And I try to use this comparison to show, to, to voice my skepticism about these accounts, and to say that the history of proportionality in constitutional law is really a post-war history, and that to the extent that earlier developments are relevant, it would have to be through a kind of filtering narrative rather than a foundational account. It's a fairly limited claim, but I, I, I think I would like to make that claim. The other point I take from this uh, brief comparison with this vast literature on, on criminalization is the point about weak states and strong states. So uh, one influential current account about differences in the use of proportionality in constitutional law is, written, is a book by two Israeli scholars, Moshe Cohen, Elia, and Ido Porat, who develop an account of why proportionality is so popular in Germany, in Israel, in Canada, and many other countries, but not in the US. And, and the terms they use for this are, is the idea of a culture of justification, as opposed to what they call a culture of authority. So what do they mean by this? A culture of justification, in their account, is a culture in which it is expected that all exercises of public authority are justified. Yeah, and they have to be justified. That's, that's a demand. Whereas in a culture of authority, that's much less the case. And so the interest is more in, in, in different aspects of the exercise of that authority. Uh, what I point out in the paper is that this leads to the same paradox as the one Jim Whitman describes for strong states and weak states in punishment. Because to my mind, intuitively, you would think about when would a culture of justification be likely to arise? Well, in a situation where there is weak authority at a central level, where people are skeptical of the government, where levels of trust in government are low, um, you might intuitively expect that that would be where you would, would get a culture of justification or at least demands for justification from below. Whereas in a situation where state authorities are strong and there is high trust, um, that perhaps justification would be less prominent. Now, of course, what the proportionality story shows is that that's not the case. And I think that can be explained very easily, but I think we need to do more work, and this will be, I think, rather political science work, to try to understand how a weak state and weak autonomy at the state level and low levels of trust, how they become associated with a culture of authority, if we want to buy that term, and how, on the other hand, in a strong state scenario, this culture of justification arises. If you think about it in schematic terms, what this suggests, I think, is that when you think about justification, every measure by the government has to be justified, that it seems that that is something that is rather granted, I mean, metaphorically speaking now, granted from above by the governmental authorities than something that is effectively demanded by the litigants. Right? Now, that's, this, is a, I mean, this is in metaphorical terms. I think political science work could make clear precisely how those dynamics work and what it is that courts are responding to in, you know, if you want to take the template of a culture of justification. So, so to point out that paradox, I think, would be uh, one thing I would like to take from the literature on, on cultural factors and criminal justice. So the last section of the paper then um, turns to the second of my two initial questions, which was, is it possible to think about proportionality in a more substantive sense? Can we make sense of that? Um, in other words, 
if it is possible to talk about punitiveness in the one field, is it possible to talk about proportionateness in the other field? So I think the word field here is important because I think if that effort is to succeed, it would have to be in the sense that proportionateness becomes the attribute of a field rather than of individual cases. I don't see how you could talk about individual cases as being more proportionate than other cases for reasons we might discuss. But, but I think if we are to make any headway here, it would have to be in the sense that we look at the field, and it would have to be probably the field of constitutional rights review, um, but I'm open to other <laughs> definitions that then might in some sense be more proportionate than elsewhere. So that is a preliminary matter. I'm responding here um, to, again, recent literature in comparative criminal justice that says it makes no sense to talk about proportionality in any substantive sense across countries when it comes to sentencing and harshness. And uh, this is a work by my colleague Nikki Lacey, who has written an article recently with a philosopher, Hannah Picard, and the article is called The Chimera of Proportionality. And so you can see what that means. It's a mirage, it doesn't, it doesn't help. And, and why is that? They say, well, because proportionality, if you think about it, it would really depend on thick substantive agreement on what the right proportions and the proportionate outcomes are. And so if you take two imaginary systems, one of them sentences, let's say, theft by five years and murder by 10 years, and the other system sentences theft by 10, by 10 years and murder by 20 years, then you know, in a simple scenario, it would be difficult to say that the one system is less proportionate than the other. It doesn't work that way. Right? And so if you think about proportionality in what you might call an ordinal sense, in the sense that you actually want to arrive at precise outcomes in terms of how many years should this person go to prison, it's very difficult to compare or perhaps impossible to compare that across systems, precisely because, as they suggest, there is no cross-country agreement on this question. Yeah? Um, and there are lots of surveys on this, actually. They don't really talk about this, but, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure that there is not enough agreement on this. That's an aside point. Uh, there are lots of surveys in International victim Sur Attitudes of Victims Survey, for example, where if you give people a basic, basic scenario, a teenager steals something from a shop should they go to prison, yes or no, and for how long? Germans consistently give much lower answers than Americans. Right? Uh, and, and in the United Kingdom, it's somewhere in between. So, so there may be something there, but let's take their point at face value and say it is impossible to compare systems in terms of their proportionateness in this sense, the sense of ranking and the sense of uh, um, what you might call ordinal proportionality. Now, what I find interesting, and this is where I think the punitive literature is helpful, what I find interesting about that literature is that it suggests different ways of talking about punitiveness than merely measuring the time that people go to prison, merely a quantitative approach. Um, and I think that's, that points the way to thinking about uh, proportionateness. So take, for example, the kinds of laws we were talking about earlier, three strikes, you're out. I assume that you're, you're familiar with what this, what this means, right? The third offense, no matter how serious or uh, how mild, uh, you go to prison for a defined minimum term, and it's usually a very long term. Yeah? Or, for example, uh, a minimum sentences without parole. What, what those measures do, and they're very popular, more than half of the states in the United States have a kind of a three strikes or outlaw. The federal, federal criminal law has a three strikes or outlaw. So they're very, very popular, and they usually date to the early 90s, mid 90s. What those laws do, I think, is of course they increase the number of people in prison and the time that these people spend in prison. Sure, that's clear. But that's not the only thing they do. What is interesting about them is that they shield the decision making process from any kind of assessment of the fit between the crime and the punishment, right? which is normally what we think about when we think about proportionate sentencing. And it is that aspect, this shielding, that I find relevant. And so I think that if that's true, if these measures really intentionally, directly, explicitly block the assessment of fit in this particular way, then 
I think you can say that they are less proportionate in the sense that they care less about proportionality. They have less space for proportionality assessment. Um, and it is, I think, precisely these kind of measures that stand out. And it's not just actual measures, it's also just the way the system works in practice. So, For example, between 94 and 97 percent of criminal convictions in the United States, almost all of them, are the result of plea bargains. And why is that the case? That's often the case. So there's no trial at all. Uh, why is that the case? That's often the case because um, of a self-reinforcing mechanism where these plea bargains become popular. The legislators, the, pop the, the politicians, want to give the prosecutors weapons in these negotiations. And so they set very long minimum sentences for different offenses so that the person who is uh, uh, accused knows if this goes to trial and if I'm convicted, I go to prison for 40 years, 50 years, even longer. Right? That's a bargaining chip for the prosecutor to say, perhaps we could come to a deal, and then you go to prison. There, too, what strikes me is the lack of concern for what you might call fit, fit between the offense and the, the, the extent of the imposition of government, government force. And some writers have suggested that, go back to the point about that people don't agree on what is the exact proportionate sentence for a crime. Right? What if, even if we did a survey in this room, you said, well, what, how, how many years should somebody get for this particular type of offense? We would probably not agree. But what is interesting about, for example, this particular measure is that these very long sentencing minimums that are imposed in the legislation are usually so long that probably if you were to ask Americans in opinion surveys, do you think this is an appropriate sentence, perhaps a majority, I don't think this work has been done, but you could do it, perhaps many people would say, oh no, I think that's, that's too long. But it's used to if, uh, as part of a bargaining process. So it's another example, along with three strikes are out, along with life without parole, where the proportionality assessment is blocked. And so in that very limited sense, I think US law may be distinctive. And so proportionateness begins to mean something very specific. Right? It begins to mean something like a tolerance or intolerance for what I call wrong answers. And it, it's a tolerance, or a intolerance rather, an intolerance for wrong answers, and this is the crucial point, in a sense that does not depend on precise societal elite or popular agreement on what the right answers would be, right? So Nikki Lacey and Hannah Picard would say proportionality doesn't work because we don't agree on what the right answers are. I'm trying to suggest that you can think of a way of a substantive understanding of proportionateness or proportionality uh, in a sense that looks to wrong answers and the tolerance for these wrong answers in a way that doesn't depend on the precise agreement on what the right answer would be. And if it's true that legal systems and, and, and cultures, let's use that term, differ in their tolerance for wrong answers, and I think that's a plausible claim, we can talk about it, then I think proportionateness, even though it doesn't sound very elegant, is a label that usefully captures that, that, this, that agreement. So um, I'll leave that point for now because I'm, I'm interested in seeing what, what Professor Tremblay wants to say about this and maybe I can then try to explain it better. Um, but uh, let me come to uh, three brief concluding points. Going back to the original uh, big question, is there a relationship between the fact that the US certainly until recently sends more people to prison than anywhere else and does so under generally harsher conditions than almost anywhere else? and the fact that US constitutional law stands out in its reluctance to embrace proportionality both as a general principle as, as a, and as a specific form, familiar form of constitutional review. I think my answer is probably yes, but it's a complicated relationship. It's not a, a, a neat one-on-one -on -one fit. For example, the relevant actors are different, if we think about constitutional review, we talk mostly about courts. If we talk about imprisonment, we talk mostly about legislatures, the police, prosecutors, and a little bit about courts. The causal mechanisms might be somewhat different, but I think there is enough to think about, th think further about the correlation. Even if you don't buy that argument, then my second point would be 
If you look towards criminal punishment and the divergence between countries, I think that still suggests that we need to construct histories of proportionality that are post-war histories. And that in fact, in the 1950s, um, US law and German law and legal thinking at this time actually were in some ways more similar than many people now suggest, perhaps even than I myself would sometimes suggest. Uh, in the US, for example, there was also an intense concern in the late 1950s with the idea of justification, that every governmental measure needs to be justified, and you can track this quite neatly. And so I think um, the best provisional account of a sort of a transnational genealogy of proportionality would say great similarity in the 1950s and up until the middle of the late 1960s, and then a divergence that we need to explain. And so the question then becomes a different one. It do, it's no longer what's the influence of Prussian administrative law on current German practices. No, it's rather why is why does the US law at the moment and US jurisprudence at the moment pay so little attention and react so negatively to something that is very similar to what they did at a certain time in a, in a particular period? Yeah, so it becomes a different question. And thirdly, final conclusion, I think it is possible to develop more substantive notions of proportionality where the scholarship would go beyond a concern with how many steps in what order consistently yes or no, I'm joking a little bit of course, uh, uh, to a more substantive understanding of how proportionate are different systems as compared to each other. And I think we can do that if we step away from the idea that proportionality is about ranking and precise outcomes, so many years for this sentence, this amount of leeway for a government when they do something rather than that amount, but we think rather in terms of a, an intolerance for wrong answers that differs among elites and among popular opinion as between different periods and perhaps uh, different places. That would be my talk. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to uh, Professor Trandé's comments. D'abord, je ne savais pas que Jaco comprenait le français, donc j'ai préparé mon intervention en anglais. Si j'avais su, je l'aurais probablement fait en français. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Very, very clear. Um, comparative constitutional law has made giant leaps in the last 10 or 20 years. And at the same time, the theory of comparative law has widely expanded. Jaco has contributed to both fields in his previous, previous uh, works, and he still does it in this paper. The paper is very dense. It is original. It's part of a broader project that I'm not sure where it goes. And it is very provocative. So I will share a few reactions. The purpose of the paper, as I see it, is twofold. First, it is to get a thicker understanding of what the ideals of proportionality might require in various jurisdictions. And secondly, it is to discover the deeper sense in which the American ideas and practices of constitutional review are distinctive. For these purposes, he does two things. First, he introduces an original approach to comparative constitutional law, the comparative comparative law, and secondly, it introduces an original concept, the concept of proportionateness, as distinct from proportionality as we tend to understand it. So I, I will make a few comments on these two contributions and then a few words on the methodology. So first, comparative, comparative law. The idea is this. I repeat it, but uh, it was clear, but I recall it. If we wish to get, to, get, to get a thicker or deeper understanding of the roles and the meanings of proportionality in comparative constitutional law, we should examine other fields of comparative law where proportionality is a central theme. So Jaco proposes to examine comparative criminal justice dealing with punishment. Let me say first that the suggestion is very original and at first glance promising. 
it seems fair to believe that a broader understanding of proportionality within, within a given legal system might produce a better understanding of what it means within constitutional law. But there is one obvious question relating to the ambition of the approach. First, the hypothesis is that comparative, comparative law may uncover the real significance of all the social and cultural factors that may explain the roles and meanings of proportionality in constitutional review. The argument is, and you didn't uh, quite explain it, but in the paper as I understand it, is the, the argument is that if we look at the studies with it comparative criminal justice, we can learn how to integrate all the relevant factors. But the problem is that the social and cultural factor or factors to which uh, you refer are almost infinite. They include jurisprudential and doctrinal analysis, the causal inference of political economy, the studies of culture, the attitudes of the people towards the court, religion, capitalism, neoliberal rationality, globalization, and so on. So it's a lot of data to integrate. Secondly, comparative, comparative law would require a kind of Herculean expertise. As we know, it is already very difficult to be expert in comparative constitutional law. There is always a danger of misinterpretation and oversimplification of what's going on in the other system. But a comparative, comparative law approach would require mastering not only one legal field in two or more jurisdiction, but two or more legal fields. Indeed, it is in the nature of the approach to examine each single legal field where a given legal principle is relevant. For the purposes of proportionality, for example, one should also examine comparative procedural law, comparative evidence law, comparative tort law, comparative negligence law, and so on. Because proportionality is active in all these legal fields. Indeed, proportionality might be relevant in every legal field where impartiality and justice have a role to play. So that would be a great knowledge of all two systems, at least. So the approach seems very ambitious, and it raises the obvious question whether it is manageable. Yet there is a less ambitious way of doing comparative, comparative law. It would be to do it for methodological purposes. The idea would be to borrow from other comparative law studies certain methods that seem relevant for our own inquiry. And this is what you suggest when you claim that we should examine the substantive outcomes instead of the formal institutions and tests. So I now turn to the concept of proportionateness. Uh, the purpose here is to measure proportionality in various local settings in a way that is more significant than merely comparing proportionality as analytical frameworks and formal tests, such as the Oakes test. The hypothesis is that proportionality should be understood in a substantive sense, that is, in terms of substantive outcomes. And to express it, you propose the substantive term of proportionateness in a way that is similar to the concept of punitiveness in comparative criminal justice. The difficult question indeed is how to measure the proportionateness of the results. So one might have believed that we should measure it according to some ideal measure, such as an abstract normative theory of justice based upon proportionality, or such as a normative procedural test of proportionality. So that would, be, that would refer to what you uh, call the agreement on the outcome, term of ranking or things like that. But this is not what you claim. The test of proportionateness is intolerance for wrong answers without assuming an agreement on the right answer. So the question becomes how to measure the intolerance for wrong answers. And it seems here that there are two ways 
Or maybe one way that has two aspects, if I uh, followed what you just said. The first is the degree to which a legal system forecloses any discussion of proportionality. So the example of three strike, you're out, and these kind of laws. And I suppose that within constitutional law, a legal system where constitutional decisions are categorical would be less proportionate than a system that does not, I guess. But the most interesting way to measure proportionateness in a sociological and is sociological and phenomenological. It consists in measuring the apathy of the population in the face of outcomes that are felt by the people to be wrong according to their own standards of individualized justice. The measure of the wrongness of the outcomes is necessarily relativist, and consequently, proportionateness is relative to social conventions and the subjective preferences of each individual. Again, it is a very original contribution, but it raises many questions. I chose one. The thesis seems plausible in the area of comparative criminal justice dealing with punishment because proportionality there is relatively well circumscribed. Its object is to balance fairly the seriousness of the crime with the severity of the punishment where fairness is understood according to a form of justice that is individualized. Of course, there are many disagreements within this framework, but there is a framework. The problem is that I'm not convinced that this is the case in the area of constitutional review. What is the object of proportionality in constitutional law? Sh simple example, should we balance rights such as conceived in the abstract or rights such as conceived from the subjective point of view of those who are affected by a law? What legislative objectives or benefits must be balanced? The ultimate purpose of the law, the, most, the more immediate purposes, or the full benefits of the law if the law is valid totally, or the mar marginal benefits that are in conflict with competing rights. But more importantly, we do not agree on the form of justice proportionality is meant to uphold. Is it a form of individualized justice as within the theory of punishment, or is it a form of abstract and universal justice? This is very controversial within the law, and it is very controversial within society. So the outcomes that the individuals may tolerate, even if they feel that they are wrong, might be very different according to the form of justice that is accepted by the individuals. So there might be fundamental disagreements in society with respect to what constitutes a right or a wrong answer. Consequently, I wonder if, if uh, it is possible to assess the individual and communal apathy in the face of wrong answers. The problem might be explained by the fact that the measure of proportionateness is relativist, so it's sort of Protagoras test or where man is the measure of all things. But my question is this. If it is correct to assume that there are fundamental disagreements with respect to the relevant form of justice, should intolerance for wrong answers constitute the substantive test of proportionateness? Is it reasonable to believe that the test might give us a thicker understanding of the ideals of proportionality in a given society, as well as a deeper sense of what is distinctive in the US approach to constitutional review? My intuition is that such a test would tell us much more about the pluralism of the society than about the legal and constitutional system. This point leads me to say a few words on methodology. In order to measure proportionateness as a sociological term, one must use the methods of the social sciences. 
My query is whether or the extent to which these methods are the most appropriate for the purposes. Uh, no doubt, I regard the social sciences with great respect. Their works are very useful for very many purposes. No doubt about that. But let me be polemical for a few minutes. Since the purposes are to uncover the deeper sense of the American distinctiveness in the area of constitutional review and to get a thicker understanding of what the ideals of proportionality might entail in specific jurisdiction, one might have believed that the best place to look at is the law itself as understood from within given the normative considerations that justify using proportionality or not using it. Since the methods of the social sciences mainly examine factors that are external to the law, they leave out what might be the most relevant factors, that is, the normative considerations internal to the law. Couldn't we claim that the best explanation of a legal institution or legal principle is a normative explanation? and that the best account of the roles and meanings of proportionality as an institution of constitutional review is a normative account. Couldn't we believe that the most significant causes of a legal institution or principle are normative, that they are the reasons, values, and ideals that have justified it and that maintain it as legally valid? Such a normative account of proportionality, although legal, would not be formalist. It would be grounded in the explicit and implicit legal values, in what is accepted as legitimate legal arguments and reasoning, the legal tradition, legal history, past decisions, the rule of precedent, which is very important, and the case being the ultimate values of the law. For example, if I were to uncover the deeper sense in which American constitutional review is really distinctive, I would examine the normative considerations explaining the way it applies or refuses to apply proportionality. So I would take into consideration the American doctrine of originalism, their conception of legal formalism, their conception of constitutional legitimacy, the rule of law, past decisions, and so on. But I know that many social scientists are generally not satisfied with this kind of normative enterprise. They tend to see it as superficial, not to say naive. So they claim that if we want to uncover the deeper meaning of a legal institution or principle, we must examine the social and cultural forces that are at work or the functions of the law in society. So we can have, take as an example the culture of authority versus the culture of justification. This comes close, by the way, of saying that the real causes of the legal institutions and values are mechanical, legal principles and doctrines would be mere effects of social and cultural forces. In my view, the problem of using the social sciences to understand the deeper meaning or the ideals underlying proportionality is that they seek to explain a normative institution or principle independently of the reasons and value that are constitutive of proportionality as a normative institution or principle. In other words, they try to understand a certain domain of thought, law as a normative domain, by another domain of thought, the social sciences. Something important might be lost. So I was saying that uh, social sciences try to understand a certain domain, domain of thought, the law, as a normative domain by another domain of thought, the domain of social sciences. So I said that if I could make a comparison, I would say that it is like trying to have 
a deeper sense of how Plato's theory of ideas is really distinctive by examining the social and cultural forces in classical Athens. Something would be lost. So in your text and in your uh, previous works, you have been very critical of the works of comparative constitutional scholars who work within the social sciences. Just the example of the, the Whitman that you are criticizing or Cohen Eliot. Um, so we might be not that far. So uh, the question here is, I don't know if you can explain how you integrate these two forms of explanations, normative or, and perhaps functionalist, if you accept the, the word to describe your own approach. I stop here and thank you again for the wonderful paper and contribution. <laughs> One way of, of defending what I'm trying to do is to say, and this sounds a bit arrogant, is that you say, well, okay, there is a lot of literature on proportionality. I'm not sure that the concerns of that literature by the lawyers are really all that helpful to the social scientists who are interested in looking to proportionality. So let's meet them a little bit sort of on their terrain, right? Whether that's successful or not is a different question, but, but that will be one way of saying what I'm you know, trying to do. What is, okay, so what is it about this literature on proportionality that, is, that I find striking? So I mentioned earlier Vicky Jackson, leading expert, an authoritative summary, 90-page article in the Yale Law Journal, Constitutional Law in an Age of Proportionality. There is one mention in that article, between brackets, where she says, well, of course we have to understand that pro using proportionality, the doctrine she means, doesn't always lead to, quote, more proportionate outcomes, end of quote. She doesn't explain what she means by that. Yeah? I find it striking that constitutional lawyers can have so much intellectually, intellectual energy devoted to a doctrine and a principle that is so important, and we are so nervous talking about proportionate, more proportionate, less proportionate, clearly we can do better than that. Maybe we will not succeed in developing a fully coherent notion of proportionateness, maybe the term will not catch on, that might be a good thing, but, but surely we can do better than one mention in, in an article like this. The same in terms of the social science and the cultural approaches. I, I think Moshe, uh, Corinne Elia, and Ido Sporat's book is, is sets an agenda, sets in a very important agenda, and they are absolutely to be commended for that. But they, don't, they use the term culture of justification, culture of authority, without ever explaining where this might come from, uh, what the dynamics are that sustain it, why here and not there, since when, for example, was a culture of justification also present in 19th century Prussia? See, I, I would find that you know, that would be n not an intuitive claim to make, but they also say that proportionality was present there. I mean, there's lots of things to be explained there, and I'm saying, well, the field of law, I think, where lawyers and social scientists have, I think, made most advances in trying to understand differences and similarities between systems, not just on a doctrinal level, but also in terms of effects on the ground, I think is the field of criminal justice. I, I don't know everything about all these other fields, but it's a very rich field, and so I'm just trying fairly selectively to take something from that. So, so I think we can do more. Um, again, what, what I find striking about the literature on proportionality in constitutional law, take, take the, the points that David Garland makes, I mentioned him earlier, about a culture of control, about the fact that we now live under conditions of late modernity about the idea that we may need to think about forms of neoliberal rationality. Even if you think that that cannot be defined, even if you don't buy that argument, it is still striking that, to my knowledge at least, we have no work, nothing, in all of the works on proportionality and comparative constitutional law that would ask the question, for example, is the turn to proportionality in all these different systems an emanation, or does it have some relation to these conditions of late modernity to a form of neoliberal reason? Is it a form of resistance to that reason? Is it an aspect of that reason? Is there no connection whatsoever? And we just simply haven't looked at that, as far as I know, we haven't looked at that question yet. And I think it's striking that, that if proportionality is arguably one of the central points of debate and focus for constitutional law, we need to think about that. 
um, I would like to know whether there's some kind of connection connection there. And then to your to your point about well, is this okay? Is this not too ambitious? Yes, uh, yes, probably it is. But I take this idea from Jim Whitman, the author of the Harsh Justice book, who is very strong about his ideas on difference between different countries, the U.S. and Europe. But what he has done is he's written not just on criminal justice, but he's also written about honor in different fields. He's written a lot about private law, tort law. And he makes the point at some point, uh, and he's done this over many, many years in an extremely distinguished career. But he is able to say at some point the cumulative evidence, the cumulative weight of all those little differences, right, strengthens his conclusions that he says, okay, I do think there is something distinctive about these American ideas as compared to the European ideas. So it's it's a it's a project of trying to trying to add little little differences and little similarities into big differences, um, and then finally on the substance of the proportionateness term. So thank you very much for what you said about this and about the ideas on the form of justice. I wrote this down: the form of justice that proportionality is meant to uphold. Yes, absolutely. There must be powerful differences there, and perhaps we can use proportionality to get a better understanding of those differences as between systems. What I'm interested in ultimately is the question of the mismatch between ideals and practical outcomes. I think if you look at the very abstract level of ideals, you find, through my intuition, very similar ideals in many modern systems. Um, but it's the, it's the question of the mismatch between ideals and practice. And you see this not just in US criminal law, but also in private law. So it has all these gold standard elements of litigation, the ideal of everyone their day in court, everyone a jury trial, extensive discovery procedures, et cetera, et cetera, punitive damages, damages that are meant to, com to compensate you exactly for the loss that you've suffered. Right? Those are the ideals, and we're all familiar with them. And yet the system works in a very haphazard way, in that some cases do go to trial and they get the gold standard treatment, and a lot of other cases get settled or they get lost in the system. And so I think it would be useful to look across different areas of law and different legal systems in terms of this question of mismatch between ideals and practice. And if we make that more precise, I think we need some kind of vocabulary for that. And I've suggested that proportionateness might be one way of capturing that because it ties in with these other questions. But if uh, people have a better word for this, I'd be, uh, I'll change the title of the paper. <laughs> But thank you so much. This was really helpful. So thank you. Thank you.